In my last video, I only covered sphere versus sphere collisions because they are the simplest to compute. Spheres are nice and all, but there comes a time when more complex shapes are needed. One popular algorithm for testing collisions is the Gilbert Johnson Kirthi algorithm, or GJK for short. With it, we can detect collisions between any two convex polygons. Testing for a collision between spheres is easy because there are only two points in the system. This leaves us with a single vector that we can compare against the sum of their radii to determine if there is a collision. With polygons, we cannot make such simplifications. They are made from multiple vertices, removing any apparent way of finding their distance and clear radius property to compare against. We need a smarter way of testing for a collision. Like we subtracted the points in the sphere system, let's see what happens if we subtract the vertices of the polygons. Subtracting two polygons with the same number of vertices is straightforward, but if we want to support various polygons, we need to subtract each vertex from every vertex on the other polygon. Because there are multiple vertices, we are not left with a single vector, but many that form another polygon. This results in a cloud of a times b number of vertices that we need to process further to select the outer convex hull from. This outer hull is known as the Minkowski difference. It represents the distance between every point on the two polygons. We are going to use it to turn two polygons into one that we can analyze to detect a collision. The key is that if the origin is inside the difference, there must have been two points that subtracted to zero, meaning there is overlap somewhere. The Minkowski difference is nice for visualization, but far too expensive to compute in real time. We need a way to simplify it. The GJK algorithm is only concerned with the outer hull of our cloud of vertices, so it would give a substantial speed up if we could cut down on the time spent finding them. Let's think about what puts a vertex on the hull. If we look closer, notice that those vertices have the most extreme components. They got to their locations from subtraction between two other vertices, so for one to be the most extreme, it must have come from the most extreme vertices on the source polygons. If we define most extreme as the furthest in some direction, we can play with the math to get this speed increase. Finding the furthest vertex is done by iterating over the set of vertices and finding the one with the largest dot product in a direction. Let D be the direction and A minus B be the cloud of vertices. Luckily for us, we can distribute and never have to compute the full difference. If we distribute the dot product and max function, we're left with this. Now all we need is a plus b steps, turning our quadratic time function into a linear one. We need to reverse the direction for b when we distribute the max function, because we want to retain the max value. We want the least extreme vertex from b to subtract from the most extreme vertex of a. These vertices are referred to as supporting points, and give us a view into the Minkowski difference without ever calculating more than we need. Let's look at the implementation. I'm going to continue to use the collider structs from the last video for consistency, but we'll only include the new pieces from this video. We'll start by adding a function that finds the support point in a given direction. Let's call it find for this point. If we have other special types of colliders like spheres, capsules, or planes, we can override this function allowing them to be used with GJK as well. Next we'll make a mesh collider with a list of vertices to act as our polygon. Find for this point needs to loop over each vertex and compare the distance along the direction. We'll keep track of the max vertex and distance to compare. Once we have iterated over all the points, we'll return the max point. We can roll all this into a function called support that will take two colliders in a direction and return the vertex on the Minkowski difference. With these functions, we have abstracted away not only any convex polygon, but any collider type that implements find for this point into a single function that we can use in the algorithm. The goal of the GJK algorithm is to determine if the origin is within the Minkowski difference. This would be easy, but we've thrown out the complete difference for the sake of performance. We only have the support function that gives us one vertex at a time. We need to iteratively search and build up what's referred to as a simplex around the origin. A simplex is defined as a shape that has n plus 1 number of vertices, with n being the number of dimensions. Practically, this represents the simplest shape that can select a region in space. For example, in 2D, a triangle is the simplest shape that can select an area containing a specific point. These shapes have simple tests that we can use to determine which vertex, edge, or face is closest to the origin. Depending on which feature is closest, we'll remove, add, or swap points to make the simplex closer to the origin. We get the vertices for the simplex from the support function, so we need to find the direction to the origin from the closest feature. If we find that the closest feature is already the closest possible, but the origin is not inside, we know there is no collision. Otherwise, if we find the origin inside the simplex, we know there has been a collision. We can see that there are two cases that we need to deal with, a line and a triangle. We need one more case in the form of a tetrahedron to select a volume if we want 3D collision detection. To represent the simplex, let's make a wrapper struct around a standard array. This will allow us to keep track of the number of points while keeping the memory on the stack for quick access. We'll need at least one point to start, so we'll manually add it. The search direction for the first point doesn't matter, but you may get less iterations with a smarter choice. I'm going to use unit x for no particular reason. Now that we have one point, we can add it to the simplex and set the search direction towards the origin. In a loop, we'll add another point. The exit condition is that this new point is not in front of the search direction. 
This would exit if the support function returns a point that was already the furthest along the direction. Now that we have a line, we'll feed it into a function that updates the simplex in the search direction. It'll return true or false to signify a collision. That's all for the main loop. It's dead simple in the world of algorithms, but the real work is in the next simplex function. We'll need a series of different checks for each shape of simplex to see what the new simplex should be and what direction we'll search in next. The next simplex function will act as a dispatcher to three other functions, one for each shape. We can add one more helper function to lessen the headache from these next functions. We'll start with the line case. There are three possible regions that the origin could be in, but realistically only two. We started with point B and searched in the direction of A, which means the origin cannot be in the red region. This leaves us with one check between the vector AB and AO. If AO is inside the green region, we move on. If AO is in the blue region, we'll come back to the line case, but B will be replaced. In this case, AO is in the same direction as AB, so we know it's in the green region. We'll set the search direction pointing towards the origin and move on. In 2D, you would not need to use cross products, but in 3D, the origin could be anywhere in a cylinder around the line, so we need them to get the correct direction. The triangle case has seven regions, but again, we can call out some impossibilities. Yellow, red, and purple cannot have the origin because the new point we added was A, meaning that the origin cannot be in the direction of the BC face. That leaves us with four regions we need to check. If the origin is outside the triangle on the AC face, we'll check if it's also in the direction of AC. If it is, then we'll remove B from the simplex and move on. If not, we'll do a line case between AB. If the origin was not in the direction of the AC face, we'll check the AB face. If it's there, we'll do the same line case between AB. Finally, if both checks fail, we know it must be inside the triangle. In 2D, we would be done and could return true, but in 3D, we need to check if the origin is above or below the triangle and move on. The tetrahedron case is the most complex, but almost entirely made up of triangle cases. We don't need to test for the origin below the tetrahedron for the same reasons as before. We only need to determine which face, if any, the origin is in the direction of. If there is one, we'll go back to the triangle case with that face as the simplex, but if not, we know we must be inside the tetrahedron and we'll return true. With that final case, we have completed the GJK algorithm. As you can see, it's not that complex looking at it from a geometric point of view. This algorithm only gives you a yes-no answer about a collision, so you cannot respond to it. In the next video, I'll cover an algorithm that uses the simplex and similar principles to find the collision normal and then maybe get into rotational physics. Thanks for watching, I hope to catch you next time.